Good afternoon, Shana Tova. I'm Elizabeth Sackler, and it is a great pleasure. And actually, it's a privilege for me to welcome you um, this afternoon and to be your mistress of ceremonies. We have a long and wonderful program today that I am very excited about, and I think you'll be very happy with as well. If you are tweetering and twittering, we are in hashtag states of denial BKM, and this is our fourth series of programs, and you can see our other nine programs on www.brooklynmuseum.org slash EASCFA slash videos. And there are many hours of very important uh, programs that I think you might be interested to see. Sunday, Monday, sundown today begins the holiest day of the year for Jewish people. It is Rosh Hashanah starting this evening. It is the head of a new year, and it's for us a time to reflect how we have been in the world, what we might have done better, things we wish we had said or things we wish we hadn't said, what hurt we have caused, and I would like to add today ways in which we have been complicit to the hurt and the pain of others. For my family and my community and my tribe, the coming week is a time to ask forgiveness from those we have hurt and of those we have harmed, either knowingly or unknowingly. Rosh Hashanah is actually the perfect day for all of us, Jewish or not, to be together for the first of our fall series of States of Denial, the Illegal Incarceration of Women, Children, and People of Color. Shana Tova, and I welcome you here for that. So we're quite perfectly titled as well, Touching Humanity, Creativity, and Transformation. This has been a year of transformation. Shared dining's journey from York Penitentiary in Niantic, Connecticut to the Brooklyn Museum was inspired by the women of York and is now sitting next to the dinner party by Judy Chicago. If you haven't seen it as yet, I hope you'll go up to the fourth floor and um, have that pleasure. Shared dining from start to finish has been groundbreaking. It has been enlightening, and I think for surely it's been healing, and I think maybe if not, it's also been kind of in its own wonderful way, a downright miracle. We have had an incredible partnership with the women of York. The women of York have experienced renewal, they have experienced love, and I believe many, if not all, have experienced healing. And two years ago, when I was first introduced to the prison, to a librarian, Joe Lee, uh, and it was made by, the introduction was made by Joanne Tucker, who is a veteran prison workshop leader. And the worlds of incarcerated people or victims of police brutality were the same then as they are now, but not in the public eye. And that's changed, as we know. The public is now aware of the inhumane and in human conditions and the illegal actions by law enforcement agents too often. We are faced knowing the problems, the unacceptables, I call them. We know where we need to work to make justice true, not injustice. And we can no longer and we should never have turned a blind eye. And today is a celebration. It is a celebration of an achievement and a call for more. It is achievement of 10 women who two years ago did not know one another all that well. Some had never made art. Some had never explored or had an opportunity to explore their inner selves, no less to have an opportunity for what they have found inside to emerge in a new way. For six months, the women of York, and I list them in order of their place settings. Kelly, Shannon, Jahara, Chastity, Trisha, Lizette, Pana, Shakima, 
Kara and Tracy created shared dining. As we know now, they are known women of York. Each woman came when I met them with distinct characteristics. They emanated maturity, confidence, earnestness, certitude, gratitude, interest, shyness, intent, and excitement. They were grounded as a group, grateful for the opportunity in the moment without artifice or pretense. Education, art, writing, dance, all kinds of forms of learning and creative outlet are essential for all people and vitally essential for incarcerated people to feed the spirit, the soul, to keep the human brain alive and healthy and to heal and nurture the confused and the damaged and the lost. Today, it is a very big honor and a great honor to have the Governor and First Lady of Connecticut, Danelle and Kathy Malloy here. The Governor and First Lady are both prison reform activists. Each has become their stations. Their commitment and success in reforming, stabilizing, and rehumanizing the prisons in their state. And I thank them, we all must thank them heartily for that. Yes, First Lady Kathy Malloy for the past four years. Kathy Malloy has led the Greater Hartford Arts Council as their Chief Executive Officer. During her tenure, she has spent time at the York Correctional Facility to foster the education and programs there. Before her move to Hartford, Kathy was the CEO of the Center for Sexual Assault Crisis Counseling and Education. Kathy received the National Sexual Resource Center's 2012 Visionary Voice Award and is establishing the Family Justice Center in the state of Connecticut, which is going to be one of 48 centers planned nationwide to provide comprehensive care for those victims of sexual assault and domestic violence. Thank you, Kathy. Kathy is an outspoken leader. Kathy is an outspoken leader and dedicated advocate for the arts and community of Greater Hartford. Governor Danell Malloy, I would like to introduce you to him, and we will have the pleasure of hearing from him and all that he has accomplished. He has been a true leader in making Connecticut a second chance society, an effort to continue driving down crime, end the cycle of violence and poverty, and give people who have erred a fresh start. Governor Beloy has been fighting for a fairer criminal justice system his whole life, first as a prosecutor, then as a mayor, and now as governor. And because it's about being smart on crime, not just about tough on crime. His Second Chance Society initiative eliminates mandatory minimums for simple nonviolent drug possession, revamps, yes, please, we must, thank you, revamps training programs for nonviolent ex-offenders and helps people get back on their feet. You have spawned nationwide attention, Governor. He has launched a transformative initiative because he believes that for too long we were building modern jails instead of building modern schools. We are investing in permanent punishment instead of permanent reform. It is my deep pleasure, and join me in welcoming, please, Governor and First Lady, Danelle and Catherine Malloy. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, it's actually uh, a great honor. I get very emotional when I talk about this subject for us to be here today. It's, it's just incredible. Um, lots to say. Um, I think uh, the first thing I want to say is, um, actually, I noticed 
up in the exhibit, one of my um, board members that was on my board when I was running the Sexual Assault Crisis Center in Stanford, she's here, and so it's great to see the support from that. That was probably the best job I ever had in my whole life. Um, can't wait to get back to that, but I'm still working very hard to establish the fam first Family Justice Center in Connecticut. It's actually one of 98 uh, in the nation, and the important thing about that is, is uh, victims of sexual assault and domestic violence right now just have to run all over the place to get help. So it's a huge um, effort for us to make sort of, in a crude sense, one-stop shopping so they can go to one place, one stop, and get all the care that they need. Um, and as we say, um, this isn't just a good thing. This is something these women and men and children deserve. So we'll be cutting the ribbon this month, which I'm very, very proud of. Um, in terms of the work at York, I was very um, involved at Bedford Hills Correctional Facility uh, when I was running the Rape Crisis Center. And actually, my clinical advisor, uh, Jeanette Trujillo, is the lead um, psych clinical psychologist at, at Bedford Hills. So, I learned a lot about women in prison um, at, at, from Bedford Hills, but then um, when I came to Hartford to run the Sexual Assault Crisis Center, um, my whole direction in running the center is really to use art for social change and n knowing how important that is. And uh, as fate would have it, you know, in public life, we get to meet some incredible people. And a woman named Judy Dworn came into my life and she's here. Judy, stand up and say hi. And um, she, she's just an incredible person. You know, you meet people and you say, oh my god, I'd like to be like her, or I'd like to just hang with her for the rest of my life. Um, she's really the hero here, in addition to the women of York, um, and she's just done incredible thing, things there, and if you think about art for social change, she's doing it all. So I love you, Judy. Thank you so much for your work. Um, and of course, Wally, um, another hero um, who's done so much with women of York. But for me, um, it's, it's, you know, these, today we're going to hear a lot of stories, and Judy helps these women articulate their stories through written word, uh, music, dance, uh, song, and of course, Wally takes those stories and, and gets them out to the public. But I think the biggest message today here um, is for you also to become storytellers after you leave here today. Um, make sure that you are telling the story of these women um, that are incarcerated and how important it is for us to get the word out um, that m the majority of these women deserve a second chance. It's absolutely critical that we support these women. Um, I probably have the statistics off by a little bit, but 98% of these women at York, um, which are, you know, of prison in general, um, are going to be coming out back into society. And, and we need to give them a chance. We need, they've, they've, they've paid their dues, they've done what they've been told, they've, they've spent their time in prison, and it's our job and our responsibility to give them another chance and make sure that they come back out and re-enter in society to a healthy life and, and move forward. So that's my ask for you today, to listen to the stories, tell your friends, um, you know, I was saying to somebody up in the display, so many times when I go out and speak about those individuals that are incarcerated, I can look in a crowd and I can just see that people don't want to hear anything about it. They have no interest and they would just assume that they just want these people just rot in prison for the rest of their lives. And that's not right, it's not going to happen, and we need to support these individuals. So thank you very much for being here today, and please speak out on behalf of these individuals. Thank you. So uh, uh, before we came up here, uh, Kathy said, I don't want to say anything. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and I said, I think you better say something. So um, uh, I, I didn't know how much time I was seeding, but uh, no. I, yeah.
but you can tell that uh, Kathy and, and that I'm uh, quite uh, passionate about uh, this issue. It's very interesting that we're here in, in Brooklyn. From 1980 to 1984, uh, I worked in Brooklyn, uh, not far from here, uh, at the municipal building was where my office was. I was a prosecutor, assistant district attorney in New York City, uh, in Brooklyn, specifically Kings County, uh, for that period of time. Um, and uh, as I am speaking about this issue, uh, you should understand that I come from that that, that background, I tried 23 felony cases here in Brooklyn. Four of those were homicides. I had convictions uh, in all but one of those uh, 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 cases. Uh, by the way, as governor, I spend a good portion of every single day uh, with, uh, with the Connecticut State Troopers uh, who are, uh, are with me constantly. Uh, I, I have that kind of background, but when I was done uh, as a prosecutor in New York City, I went home uh, to Stamford where I did defense work uh, and some of that as an appointed counsel uh, in Bridgeport um, as well, where I tried yet another homicide on the defense side. Um, uh, I came away over a period of time, both uh, as a prosecutor, uh, then as a, a mayor, um, as a father, now as a governor, to understand that we have these great disparities um, uh, in our society. Uh, and we're collectively responsible for a number of those disparities. They're not just happenstance. Uh, they didn't just come about. Uh, actual things were done uh, that created situations um, of great despair uh, and great uh, difference in outcomes and treatment uh, of individuals. One of those uh, we took on, or a series of those we took on this year legislatively, a battle that we came very close um, to losing, and quite frankly only won uh, when I decided that I was going to be quite obvious in pointing out the racial disparities. Uh, that some of our laws in Connecticut and most states uh, actually present. Uh, one of those disparities were, like a lot of states, we had passed drug uh, legislation uh, that increased uh, the penalty if you possessed, possessed drugs close to a school, close to a, a, a medical facility uh, and other places. Uh, and what we started to do in Connecticut was to make maps uh, and demonstrate uh, that there was no place in New Haven, practically speaking, or Hartford, uh, or gigantic uh, swaths of uh, uh, Bridgeport. In fact, any community with a sizable um, Hispanic or black population uh, had disparate zones of mandatory treatment for exactly the same offense. Uh, and part of what we decided to do in Second Chance Society legislation this year was to undo that and quite frankly to say that we, uh, we appoint judges and we have judges to carry out justice, tying their hands, uh, uh, requiring that they incarcerate someone for exactly the same offense that they would be entirely differently treated in another community makes no sense at all. And it was predicting uh, and it was manufacturing situations where many more black and Hispanic people were being incarcerated. Now why do I think that that's a difficulty? The reality is for many people, uh, prison, that first prison experience uh, represents an advanced degree in crime. So the idea that we would take people, uh, treat them differently, and then put them in a situation that was almost certainly, uh, if not certain, uh, much more likely uh, to lead to further arrest, further difficulties, difficulties in obtaining housing, jobs, even a student loan, made no sense at all. Uh, and I am fond of saying that as a society in America, we became far more invested in permanent punishment than we were uh, permanent reformation. Undoing this is going to take years to do in our society, in our state by state, uh, in our federal uh, alignment. Uh, but getting to York, as I have on three occasions, getting to other prisons in our system, having visited prisons uh, on other occasions, and now having visited prisons in different systems uh, in different countries, you come away with the knowledge that there is a better way to do this than how we're currently doing this. We should be at least as invested in turning people's lives around if they have to be incarcerated as we are in the punishment uh, factor. And quite frankly, we should do as much as we can to delay put off uh, and quite frankly eliminate to the greatest extent possible incarceration because it, it, it represents in many cases an advanced degree 
and criminal behavior. It does not make sense. And then, of course, the, the, the work that's not done in most prisons uh, is the other side of the story. Uh, uh, not good education programs in most uh, 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 prisons, not good uh, 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 art or humanities uh, uh, training programs. Uh, it, it's not happening uh, in most of America. I, I visited uh, this past uh, spring, and then I'll stop and get off the stage, uh, a prison in West Germany, uh, in, in Berlin. Berlin is both a city uh, and represents uh, the equivalent of the state. About three and a half million people, exact same size of Connecticut. In Connecticut, as I stand before you, we have 16,000 people thereabouts incarcerated. In Berlin, they have 4,000. In Berlin, uh, when you go to prison, uh, you get a good education. The programs are actually offered. You have a job while you're in prison. You have responsibility. Even on the longest sentences, eventually you get visitation home. And they have job programs where 98% of the people are placed as soon as they leave prison. So this idea that prison should mean you never get housing, you never get a job, and in America you can't get a student loan is not, does not mean, need to be the way that we do this in the future. And the disproportionate impact on women, of course, is one of the things that we talk about here today. So as my wife has said, uh, our sharing this story, since I suspect that most of us are believers in what we're attempting to do collectively, uh, is a wonderful and empowering thing because we'll uh, develop strength from it. Uh, but as Kathy has said, it is about telling that story, having that understanding, understanding what the disproportionate impacts racially, financially, geographically, and in their outcomes. Understanding all of those things and then doing something about it is what we're here, at least in part, to do. Thank you and have a good day. I just, um, I just forgot to mention one person, a very, very dear friend, Joe Lee, who's, who's left the prison to go on to some different things. But Joe was a dedicated um, librarian and ran the library for many, many years and had great relationships with the women at York. And, um, thank you for all your time you spent there, Joe. Appreciate it. So, we get to see the woman behind the man and the man behind the woman. And what great work and how lucky Connecticut is to have a governor and first lady um, doing the work that they're doing. Thank you very much. And I have other thanks also for us, the Three Guineas Fund and Catherine Muther, who supported uh, the Women of Yorkshire Dining Exhibition, which is in the Sackler Center uh, upstairs on the fourth floor. And I thank you, Susan Mizellis. I don't know where you are here, for making available your beautiful photographs to us. And to both Susan and Catherine um, for having uh, uh, audio taped the women of York so that many of our visitors uh, who come have had the uh, joy, really, and the uh, interest of, of listening to the voices of the women. And I would like to also thank the Novo Foundation, because the Novo Foundation is funding this year's six uh, series of programs of states of denial, and we are very appreciative to them, uh, to the executive director, Pamela Schiffman, and of course to Jesenia Santana, who is the program officer for the initiative to end violence against girls and women. Thank you, Novo Foundation. It is, yeah, thank you. It is uh, thrilling uh, to have author and educator Wally Lamb in conversation with Kelly Donnelly and Lizette Oblitas Cruz, both of whom participated in my workshop at York, creating their place uh, settings, Feminine Energy, and this is Lizette's uh, Phyllis Porter. It's wonderful to have you out and have you here. We are all of us indebted to Joe Lee, uh, without whom Shared Dining Workshop uh, and Exhibition wouldn't have happened. Joe, as Kathy has said, was the librarian at York for more than 20 years and made all possible for all the women of York. He championed and hosted workshops, 
created and cared for an extraordinary library at York with an unwavering belief in the power of education and the power of art and of the goodness of people. And I thank you, Joe. I am, a, it is a pleasure for me to introduce you. I call you the guardian angel of York. Joe began his career as an educator at the York Correctional Institution for Women in Niantic in 1994, and in 2003, he became the library media specialist. From the start, Joe incorporated arts into his teaching, realizing creativity was not limited by a lack of previous academic success, and knowing the skills learned or utilized at the arts would enhance other areas of study. For the past four years, he has assisted with the college programs offered at York, and this year he helped establish the Free to Succeed program, a collaboration with Trinity College, the Resettlement Program, Judy Dwarn Performance Project, and Manchester and Capital Community Colleges. Free to Succeed. <laughs> Free to Succeed creates the opportunity for women leaving York and we hope there will be many, many women leaving York, and many of the women who worked on shared dining joining us for another states of denial, but giving the women an opportunity to continue their education and to attain an associate's degree. Joe has taught also as an adjunct professor at Central Connecticut State University and Trinity College. He earned his MA in applied theater at the University of Manchester. Manchester, England, England, across the Atlantic Sea, and the, after 20 years with the Department of the Corrections, Joe is recently retiring, which we haven't seen yet, and he plans to be active with several of the arts uh, and nonprofits and teach at Trinity College as well, both here in the United States and in the UK. So Joe is going to introduce our panel, uh, which will include, as I have said, Wally Lamb, and I please uh, welcome, join me in welcoming Joe Lee and our panelists today, Wally Lamb, Kelly, and Lizette. And what an incredible turnout. It's like a family reunion. Um, it's a bit surreal for us to be here today. I think that's fair to say. <laughs> I think the last time the group of us were together, it was at York CI, sitting on plastic chairs in a circle, in a workshop, or attending a performance. Today is a lot different, and it feels a lot better. So we're happy to be here today. We're happy to share with you, share dining, which thanks to Elizabeth Sackler and Rebecca Taffel and Joanne Tucker and Susan Mizellis and Catherine Muther, who were the guiding lights behind the project that brought shared dining to the Brooklyn Museum. Um, so we thank them for all of their work and their dedication. And I know that Elizabeth mentioned it before, but there are 10 women, the women of York, and two of them are with us today, which is phenomenal. Um, eight couldn't be here. They're still incarcerated at York. Uh, Kelly, Shannon, Yahira, Chastity, Trisha, Lizette, Panna, Shakima, Kara, and Tracy. And they all agreed to come to a one-day workshop that lasted for nearly two years. Uh, <laughs> and that's pretty typical of DOC. We kind of miss our time in, inside prison. It takes a lot longer than it does on the outside. So it takes two years to get a doctor's appointment and two years to get into school and two years to finish a one-day project. <laughs> but what it does is it shows the willingness of the women to risk themselves and their stories um, and to stay with a project and help it develop on its journey. None of us had a vision for this project to be here today and to go on as it's going to go on in other iterations. Um, and I just think it really exemplifies the women. 
And I'm going to have the panelists introduce themselves because they'll do a better job and just tell you who they are and how they were connected to York. And just one quick piece on expectations. When I've attended workshops, and Wally's used this before as well, um, we usually ask to do a where I'm from poem or where I'm from prompt. Um, and my phrase always begins with I'm from a place I'm from a place with low expectations and unlimited possibilities. And to me, that really signifies prison and the women in prison in that we, unfortunately, as a society, have been conned into believing by the media that the women do not have value and we do not have expectations for them. But when given the opportunity, time and again, they amaze us with how much they have to offer. So thank you for honoring them and for being here today. Please, sorry. I know. At York, at York, we always have boxes of Kleenex because we're always crying all the time. Um, it's just a hormonal thing. And even if you're a guy, I'm sorry, it's sympathy hormones. We have to, we have to, we have to, we have to follow suit. Um, so if we could just introduce ourselves, tell everybody who you are, and maybe how you became associated with York CI, just so people have an idea of who, who we are and who we're on the panel. So if Kelly, if you want to just introduce yourself. And... Uh, my name is Kelly Donnelly, and uh, I entered York, York uh, in the fall of 2004. And uh, I left in the spring of 2015. I spent nine and a half years behind the walls of York, and um, I'm still getting my sea legs, <laughs> um, you know, getting off that island. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm so grateful to be here, to be part of this amazing project that grew amazing, huge wings and flew to great heights, and I'm honored and humbled and privileged to be here. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lisette Oblidas Cruz, and um, I enter your correctional institution back in um, June of 2010. And I served four years and almost four months behind bars. Um, and um, throughout this journey, I finally was able to see the light at the end of the tunnel um, upon my release day uh, back in a year ago. Uh, I was released in August of 2014, so I just uh, celebrated my first year of freedom. Uh, and life never tasted as good as this past year. Um, so the experience had been incredible, uh, extremely painful, but within all that pain, um, a lot of great things came to life. And um, I appreciate people like Joe Lee and um, Wally Lamb, among the many others, Judy Norwin and um, Connie, and all the people behind um, the facility that never gave up on us, never judged us, or looked at us based on our crime label um, that really sat with me and um, really um, allowed me to see that light at the end of the tunnel uh, for those long four years. So for that and more, I am very grateful to be here. Thank you. Hey everybody, my name is Wally Lamb. Um, <clears throat> looking out on this crowd, I, uh, I didn't expect that you were all gonna be so distinguished. Had I known, I would have worn my full length socks, but uh, <laughs> sorry about that, next time. So um, uh, I'm, uh, back in 1999, I had just come off a double ride on the uh, Oprah Book Club um, roller coaster, and I was looking for ways to give back. I was scratching my head and saying, you know, if, if karma is going to give me something like this, um, what do I owe karma? So, um, uh, 
shortly after that, the then librarian of York called, and she said, um, we're in trouble down here. A couple of women have committed suicide. Um, there have been other attempts at suicide, and we're just trying to um, find ways to distract the women. Would you come down and talk about your writing? Um, reluctantly, I said I would, and uh, procrastinated a great deal. And then finally, I went down one afternoon for what I thought was a one-time deal. Um, and um, so we were sitting around in a circle and um, talked about my writing. And uh, when it was time for questions and answers um, about writing, all the hands went up. I said, yes. Um, you met Oprah? <laughs> yes, I did. Next question. Yes, you over there? What's Oprah like? <laughs> Will she be wearing false eyelashes? Uh, and uh, anyway, at the end of that, uh, at the end of that one and a half hours, um, I'm packing up my stuff to go, thinking that my uh, my my duty has been dispatched. And one of the women, the scariest looking women in the group, who sort of looked at me like this the whole time, and uh, she raised her hand, and I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, thank you for coming. And I said, oh, you're welcome. And she said, are you coming back? <laughs> and I think it's just because I'm such a damn chicken that I said, OK. <laughs> and that was 16 years ago. Uh, because um, as, as most of you know, you give a little, you get so much back. Um, I had been a teacher all my adult life. I taught uh, about 25 years at the North Tree Academy. I taught at UConn. Uh, but I have not ever worked with students who are so dedicated to learning and um, so driven to revise their work uh, and make it as good as it can get. Um, so right now I'm going to share with you um, some of the work from the workshop, uh, five short pieces by five different women. Um, the first one is by Robin Ledbetter, and it's one of those where I'm from poems. Um, Robin entered the prison, I believe, in 1996 as a 14-year-old. Um, she has a 50-year sentence, 5-0, and she is due to get out when she's 64. Um, she's made a couple of suicide attempts. Um, she has told me that um, when she tries to imagine a life starting at age 64, uh, she loses ground and, um, and, 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 and gives up hope. But then she comes back again. Um, this is Robin Ledbetter's piece, Where I'm From. I'm from brick buildings and concrete parks from a place where government cheese and oodles of noodles make a meal, and roaches lay face up in a puddle of raid. I'm from weed smoke, crack smoke, coke heads, and dope heads, from swim lessons and an open fire hydrant, and street games like Red Light, Zoom Zoom, and the one grown-ups want to play called Can You Keep a Secret? I'm from secrets, from grandma carrying a Bible she cannot read, from a daddy gone missing and a mommy stolen by smack and HIV, her love just a memory. I'm from, you better be home before them street lights go on. And what happened when, lured into the shadows, I disobeyed, wandering in and out of concrete parks and brick buildings with no basements in a place called longing. This next piece is by um, a woman who unfortunately has passed away. Nicole Pierce was in her, um, in her late 20s when she died of cervical cancer a couple of years ago. Um, she, was, uh, she had not yet been sentenced, but she had been at York uh, for a number of years for a very serious crime. Um, it was connected to the fact that um, she made an impulsive decision and decided to go off from her California home um, with a boy that um, she was sexually attracted to. Um, she became an addict, and then she became uh, a, cr a criminal. Uh, this is her piece. My muscles are sore, but I can't keep still. 
My skin feels clammy. My eyelids are posted wide open despite how tired my body feels. My elevated heart rate thumps loudly. My, the heat is on and the room is roasting, fogging up the windows, but I'm cold, shivering. My stomach cramps up and I fight the bile from traveling up my throat. There isn't anything worse than feeling this way. Where is he? I'm so sick. I need it. When he walks in, a sense of relief comes over me. It's not him I yearn to be with anymore, but the drug he's concealed in the inner pocket of his jeans. He's holding a bottle of Poland Spring and looking wasted. I sit up, grab the bottle of water from him. It's time to get down to business. My clothing is drenched in the stench of day-old sweat. I scoop myself up to the top of the bed and lean back my head against the headboard. I, crap, I crack the cap of the water bottle and pour a small amount into it. Take a 50cc syringe from my bedside table. I remove the orange protection cap and put the needle's tip in the water. Draw it up, watching the liquid fill each unit. The sweat rolls between my breasts and down my stomach. My palms are slick and slippery, and it's difficult to get a good grip on the plastic syringe. The bent, scorched metal dinner spoon lies on the table. He tosses me a handful of those stamped, translucent baggies. I'm in love with what's inside of them. I tear the bags open one after another and pour the contents into the wrecked spoon. Then, taking the syringe, I drop water into the bowl of the spoon and watch it form a moat around the powder. Turning the needle around, I use the plunger to blend the water and the dope. The mixture thickens, and then a murk, it turns a murky light brown. I pick up the spoon, grab my bic, placing the flame beneath it. The dirty water begins to boil. I place the spoon back down on the table, pull the cotton from a Q-tip, and roll it between my fingers. And when I drop it into the spoon, its clean white color turns dark. I draw the tainted water up into the syringe, placing the needle prick onto the cotton so that I can better suck up the heroin. I fill each unit, until in the, unit in the syringe, leaving only a small space for my blood to register. As I search my bruised arm for a vein, my dreams and aspirations drift even further and further away. Um, one of the things that's very difficult for women who enter prison is that um, so many of them are moms. And so their kids have to be um, taken care of by grandmothers and friends and sisters and so forth. Um, this is a little poem by Christina McNaughton, uh, who happily is, has been out for a number of years now. Um, this, this poem was published in The Sun magazine a while back. Its title is Pictures of a Daughter Viewed from Prison. You set the photos down, spreading time around you panorama style. Button-nosed baby, toddler, little girl, bigger girl. Your eyes roam the chain of living paper dolls, the side-by-side -side smiles posed just for you. Time cannonballs you in the gut, and you think, when the hell did all this happen? How did I miss so much? Too late to cry, too late to mourn the baby smell, the small heft, the music of her giggles. The middle photos blur become the space between your first photo and your latest. You look up at the clock. Time has just stolen another hour. Um, Lynn Friend has one of the saddest stories of any of the women that I've worked with over the years. Um, and she survives largely through um, comic relief. Um, she also makes us cry. Joe mentioned that there's always Kleenex, but sometimes in Monica Lord's room, uh, there is no Kleenex, but there's one of those giant rolls of toilet paper. Uh, <laughs> it's about this wide, and uh, so we use that in a, <laughs> in a pinch. Anyway, um, here's, a, here's one of Lynn's funny pieces. She writes, during the ceremony, I looked from the bridal couple to the gathering of friends and family who had come to witness their union. 
Swept up in the magic of the day, I was listening intently to the minister's meaningful words about holy matrimony and unconditional love when, without warning, it happened. The elastic waist of my elegant hand-sewn underwear had just broken, and that fancy underwear was heading south. <laughs> oh no, I thought, this could only happen to me. My sister Andrea was standing next to me. I leaned toward her and whispered, you're not gonna believe what just happened. <laughs> Lynn, she whispered back, I swear to God, if you make me laugh, there's gonna be hell to pay. We had a history, my sister and I. I would make her laugh at inappropriate moments, and in an attempt to stifle ourselves, our shoulders would move up and down with silent guffawing. Yeah, but the elastic on my underwear snapped, and they've fallen down to my knees. I shifted my position. Whoa, make that below my knees. <laughs> Andrea's shoulders started moving up and down. That started me going. The shoulder sisters were at it again. If only I had worn pantyhose. I placed my hand just below my knee, along the outside of my dress, of course, and managed to pinch a little of the lace trim. I tried inching the underwear a little by little back up toward my rear end. I couldn't get a strong hold, uh, though, and they kept slipping back down to my knees. Oh my God, I thought, they'll be saying their vows soon. I had better figure out something quickly, because once the minister invites the groom to kiss the bride, I'll have to take Dan's arm and walk back up that aisle. And how the heck am I gonna get myself out of this one? <laughs> I'll let her know about that applause. Uh, she's, still, she's still serving time. Um, finally, the last one I'll read is by uh, Barbara Parsons. Uh, she, was, um, uh, she was incarcerated at York for about, I think, uh, 15, 16 years uh, out of her 25-year sentence um, for ha having um, killed her abusive husband. Um, she, th some of the writing that she did um, was um, awarded the Penn American Center's First Amendment Prize, uh, which is funded by, uh, by the Paul, Paul Newman Food Company. Um, when that happened, uh, and she won that prize, which came with a $25,000 um, award, uh, I was kicked out of the prison for a while, <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 uh, and the prison, I was investigated, the women were investigated, um, and then, um, and then in the cruelest cut of all, about five years worth of the women's work was deleted from the hard drives of the computers. Um, it all came out okay. Um, the, the stuff came back eventually, thanks to Tex. Um, Barbara was able to get, um, get her, her, uh, her prize money when she served her sentence and got out of prison. Ironically, that was about the same month that our then governor, John Rowland, went into prison, so they, they waved to each other. Uh, um, I, uh, I have, when, I, you know, when I hear um, Governor Malloy and Mrs. Malloy uh, talk, uh, it's, it's, like, um, it's like the air has, and the, the prison has become oxygenated again. Um, thank goodness we have a much more enlightened leadership than we did back in those very dark days. Anyway, this is Barbara Parsons. It's strange. They say women often without realizing it marry versions of their fathers. But Mark was more like my mother, sweet and loving at first, and later angry, needy, and unpredictable. Two years into our marriage, he was diagnosed with the same disease that mom had suffered, paranoid schizophrenia. But unlike mom, he refused to take his prescriptions, medicating himself instead with alcohol. Mark was my second husband. Our relationship began when my roommate's Amazon parrot landed on his head as he walked out of my cottage with a peanut butter sandwich in his hand. It ended 11 years later with dead chickadees lying on the ground beneath my bird feeder. Mark had grabbed one of his guns and used the birds for shooting practice. The freedoms that I've begun to reclaim on the prison's minimum security side have helped me cope with post-traumatic stress disorder. Color is healing for me, and so green vines and pastel blossoms 
bordered the window and bulletin board of my room. Sunflowers and butterflies adorned the walls. I don't know how old my mother's father was when he first molested her, but I was four when he molested me. After he finished and we left the small storage room where he had taken me, the trees, the sky, the neighbor's lawns had all turned gray. The night I shot Mark, our bedroom was awash in yellow. In an out-of-body experience, I watched the woman pick up the gun, unable to stop her. And now I sit in a circle with other inmates, baffled by what my fellow survivors of abuse are saying. How could all our men, strangers to one another, have spoken the same phrases? I'm going to do whatever I want to do whenever I want to do it. No one else would ever want you, so you better get used to it. Where could you go where I wouldn't find you? Sweetie, I swear it's never going to happen again. Hearing Mark's words come out of these women's mouths, I flash back to the night I confronted him about his affair with a 15-year-old girl. I see his smirk, hear the way he turns things around so that the problem is my unreasonableness. Why can't I just be patient while he decides whether he wants to stay or leave me? I know I can't win this argument. I never win it. He is an imposing, overweight man, six foot two to my five feet five, and he's strong as hell. He has many more guns than he needs, and he has hinted that someday, if I push him hard enough, he might have to make me disappear. The voices in the women, of the women in my group drift back, and I understand the fatal error we have in common. We stayed with our abusers because we both loved and feared them, and because they were talented manipulators, masters of the bait and switch who kept us constantly off balance. As Sandra speaks about the sexual abuse she endured, I remember my pain during and after Mark's violent poundings. Tears blur my vision. How could he have done those things to me and called it love? How could I have allowed him to do it? In tears, Ava tells us what her husband did to their four-month-old daughter. It was hard for me to register what I was seeing, she says. He was bent over her, licking up and down her legs, licking her private area. Nauseous, I begin to sob. I blame myself, my stupid, uneducated denial for the fact that my husband molested my granddaughter as my grandfather had molested me. When my children were growing up, I had tried so hard to keep them safe, to break that cycle of abuse, but I had failed my sweet, beautiful granddaughter. She had been harmed because I had stayed with Mark, convincing myself that his failings were my fault, my responsibility. And in the middle of that worst night, the room had gone yellow, and I had taken his life, an irrational and horrible act of last resort in defense of the child of my child. That night, my life as I knew it collapsed. 24 hours later, I had been processed into this sisterhood of misfits called York CI. Thank you. All right, Wally, thank you. I think the, the title of, of today's program, um, Touching Humanity, Creativity and Transformation, couldn't be more poignantly brought to light than by sharing the stories of the women at York that you shared and touched on issues of abuse and drug addiction and tragedy um, from young people uh, throughout the spectrum uh, of life. And so we're gonna kind of get into our program and I have some questions prepared for the panelists. And then we're gonna really do what is more important is we're gonna open up to questions from you all um, because as I can see, since the lights are up, thank God in the house, many of you all have had contact with the criminal justice system as either residents um, or family members, friends, volunteers, or staff members. And I really encourage you to ask questions or share your experiences based on the issue of creativity and transformation. Um, so we'll get to that point and, and then we'll do that. And then we have a wonderful reception outside. Um, we'll be taking lots of pictures and sending memories back to the women at York 
Um, so we encourage everybody to do that and do upstairs to see shared dining if you haven't. So the first question, and, and basically, I'm hoping it's an engaged conversation that I'm going to try to steer a little bit, which I doubt is going to happen, uh, <laughs> and keep us on, on topic. Um, but just to, to set the scene, is like, why art in prison? Uh, prison, when you think about prison, I don't think you think about art. I think you think about a lot of things, and I don't think art is one of them. So I really want you to think back and, and, and just try to feel what was it that made the connection for you all in art, whether it's writing or visual arts or performance, poetry, movement, dance. Um, what was it about prison and art that made the connection for you? And if you can share some, some of that, I think it'd be enlightening to see how art enters a prison that is not typically thought of. Well, um, for me, um, one of the first experiences I had was letter writing, uh, you know, to literally sit down and write my family. And I know, and to really express myself, and I know, you know, being in Wally Lamb's writing group uh, kind of helped me hone that um, it's a beautiful art, it's, it's a lost art, uh, to be able to sit and uh, share your most intimate thoughts and, and what's really going on and to tell a story and to tell it well uh, was, you know, the beginning, you know, to get in touch uh, with writing again, you know. Um, and for me, uh, it, how I introduced was, you know, getting a hold of a colored pencil was like gold, uh, especially in assessments in the very beginning coming in. So I would make uh, little doodles on my, uh, on my stationery and, you know, do hand, and, you know, hand, uh, handmade stationery, make it really personal and pretty and, and what have you. But my first experience uh, with art was through the prison, uh, prison arts. Uh, I had a roommate who sketched and she would bring out her sketches and, and, and colorful pictures and uh, and I said, I want to, you know, I, I, I want to tap into that, you know, just to bring a little, little bit of color uh, into, into the space. It's so void of color, you know, our cells. And to be able to put those sunflowers up on the bulletin board or, you know, little uh, creative expressions, uh, you know, took away you know, made you not such a, a number, that there was individuality, you know, going on. So that was my first, but I, I really discovered, I really unearthed uh, an inner artist uh, within myself at the, you know, during my time, and uh, in a poet that I didn't know existed, um, you know, um, inner dancer, and um, I, I really explored through the arts. And so, yeah, that was, that was my early take on um, being creative. Um, for me, um, I can't quite really pinpoint when exactly I thought of myself as an artist or, or found this is my refuge. I think at my lowest, which was the very beginning of being stripped away from your identity or whatever you thought or I thought defined me as an individual, um, the moment I entered the facility and I was just handed this uniform and this ID number, and then officers constantly will say, you, our numbers go there, and you go there, and you don't talk, and, and I feel so constricted and so deprived, and I guess all the, the feeling of guilt and shame and, and, and the sadness and anger, it was just all like entwined in myself, and I felt there was no way of letting it out. And um, 
I remember um, within my first week of incarceration, I was provided within the fourth, fifth day a pen. The first time I saw a pen, and I was like, I need to do something. And I grabbed a piece of paper and I drew the picture that I will be handed and I was to wear wherever I went within the facility. If the, my mock picture uh, next to my inmate number and I drew myself, just, just made a replica of that with a pen. And as I was working on this blank ink paper, um, drawing this picture of a sad face looking straight at a camera, that's the moment when I think I said, I need to find a way in which I can redefine myself. Um, in other words, I am no other person in this picture. And from that moment on, I just cling on to anything that will allow me to reinvent myself, whether it was through a book, get into a character, uh, a program. Eventually, I joined uh, Wally Lamb's writing class, which to me was very healing. I think it was more therapeutic um, in the sense that I got to learn more about myself and things that maybe I did not want to look within me and my experience. Um, but thanks to the program and, and how well connected the women were and so open about talking about the funny experiences as well as the bitter ones was okay. Um, so little by little, starting from that one moment that I got the pen, uh, as I incorporated myself in the lifestyle of an inmate following certain rules um, and eventually getting myself around people like Mr. Lee and holding a job and being able to join other programs that were provided in the facility, I slowly transformed myself and reinvented myself, trying to be more than just my number and my crime. Great. And Wally? Well, I think a lot of people think of prison as a place where somebody who's been convicted goes to be punished. And then many of us believe that prison is a place where there is opportunity um, for a woman or a guy to rehabilitate themselves. And when you punish people, as opposed to being merciful and giving them, giving them access to the arts, um, um, you are creating recidivism. Or you help, you're, you're helping that, that equation. Um, one, of the, one of the people sitting out here today is Robin Cullen, who I worked with in the early days of the program. Robin, you want to just wave there and say hello? Yeah. Uh, Robin, if you don't mind my sharing, was, she was in, um, at, at York for a, a DUI fatality. And when she got out, she has done wonderful work with, uh, with um, uh, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. She's, uh, uh, she's worked very, very hard and very long at, um, at uh, you know, trying to prevent the kinds of, of crime that uh, she, was, she went in for. But one of the things that Robin, I remember her saying, is that you can't beat a person well. You know, you can't beat them until they're cured somehow. Um, so, um, so the arts is a way to rehabilitate. Um, the, to make art of any kind is to take a risk. Um, and prison is a place where it's probably a good idea not to trust too many people uh, because some people are there that are going to exploit you. Um, but the women, one of the things that I observed in our group is that the women created this sort of oasis of trust for themselves and one another. And once you bear your soul and, and tell your history and, and, and other people are bearing witness and saying, oh yeah, that happened to me too, then your, your burdens lighten, the secrets come out of you and are shared. And you know, if you carry a heavy object among several people, it's not as heavy as carrying it by yourself. So that's the first step, getting, getting to trust the others in, in a group making art. 
And then from there, um, then you got to get down to business and practice craft. And that's what, you know, the women really invested in and, and why they became, you know, successful enough to be published authors. And that the process of the storytelling that Kathy uh, Malloy gave us a call to today to, to go out and share these stories so people really understand your experiences and how they resonate with individuals. And the connection to the dinner party uh, that Elizabeth was, was, had so much foresight to bring to York uh, really resonated because that was Judy Chicago's reaction to the elimination of women from a recorded history. And, and women at York and women throughout the country in prison and, and inmates in, in, in prison um, are removed not only from our recorded history but from our current consciousness. Um, so to be able to become storytellers, to share your stories, to take control of your story, not to let other people control your story, and to have it be heard heard is really important. And I think what I think we just heard is that, that both Kelly and, and, and Lizette spoke about telling a story and how that impacts your own personal identity and how it, how it hopes to change your identity. And, and Wally's constantly uh, saying in, in, in his writing program is to edit, edit, edit. And that's exactly what's happening in any form of, of art that you have going on at the prison. And, and, I, and we also have, we've been very, very fortunate, and thank God, Joanne Tucker, uh, is here, but thank God she's on the planet. Uh, because Joanne was, was the first person who came to us and, and asked if we, if we wanted to do an arts-based residency, because she'd received a grant from the phenomenal Nathan Cummings Foundation here in, in New York, um, and I'd asked her to come and do a one-day workshop, and she wanted to do a week-long residency, and how could you say no to that? Um, and so she was able to help us really kick off the residency programs that we have at York and, and the value and the benefit um, that we, we get from those. And from those projects have led to the performance pieces through Avoda and Judy Dworn. And, and, and I just also want you to reflect on what's it like to have a piece that you've written or created performed. And performed, one of the great things we have at York is we have a family's performance. So families come in and they're able to witness their loved ones performing and sharing their stories and growing and transforming through creativity and the arts. And so maybe if you could speak to what's it like to have a piece that you've created, performed, either performed by yourself or performed by others. Um, for me, um, I, I, I've been fortunate enough to have uh, work published in uh, I'll Fly Away with Wally Lamb. I've had pieces uh, performed uh, finally by myself uh, with the Judy Doran Performance Arts uh, Project, as well as my uh, pieces had been brought out by her company uh, while I was still incarcerated. So to be able to have uh, my works and, and my stories uh, be told while I was still incarcerated was just enormous, uh, you know, my to have my family and friends and uh, to see me in a, in a whole new light, uh, just uh, totally embraced, uh, brought, uh, brought me closer uh, with, with friends and family and uh, just a wonderful connection. I was also part of the prison arts uh, program while I was in there and I uh, had my pieces showcased at different art shows. And so uh, that really helped, it, it really enriched, the arts enriched my life uh, deeply and still continues to do, to do so. And um, it uh, helped me to find a new way of expression find a different voice, a different way to, uh, to express myself. There was a time uh, in my life when I got wrapped up in, you know, running, you know, running 100 miles an hour, work, uh, taking care of my, my ailing mother, uh, taking care of everyone in my life, that I lost my voice, I lost who I was, uh, just in the rat race of life and through addiction with alcohol. Um, so when life, uh, you know, uh, 
slam the brakes on and, and uh, I ended up incarcerated, uh, I was able to find new ways of expression through the arts. And um, I'm just grateful, uh, you know, to have discovered all these great treasures, uh, you know, within. And uh, the arts helped me transform my life and uh, shine light. And just, um, it's just been an amazing journey. And I'm very, very happy uh, to be here. So, yeah. Mr. Lee, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> I got all like, I know. what she's saying. I'm just getting other ideas of my own experience. So, what was it again? I I'm mean, serious. I think really looking at how what you've created and how, when you see it performed or exhibited, how, what is that experience like? What has it meant to you? Whether it's been a family's performance or a, a public or even a, a prison based exhibition? Um, oh, I. I think, I know, it was throughout the experiences that I had uh, involving the arts, I felt the end result was very liberating. Um, I felt as though from, I think I, I was in, was it Avada? Mm -hmm. um, and Judy Dorwin, and there was uh, one, one, I think one time we had that uh, mobile theater, Right. happened at York, a little workshop, and so also with Avada, it's a workshop that lasted a week, uh, if I'm not, if I don't, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, and uh, with Judy Dorwan, it was a more of a longer, uh, long-term uh, workshop as well, where uh, women were encouraged to write, whatever, there was a theme. Uh, each year we changed, this is the case with Judy Dorwan uh, performance. Uh, and women will write their stories. At the very beginning, I was very hesitant. I felt, uh, well, I'm originally from Peru, and I uh, migrated to the state when I was 17. So uh, when I uh, was incarcerated, I entered a facility when I was 29, so maybe was, I was 30, 31 when I um, entered uh, and was able to join all these programs. I felt somewhat hesitant and very doubtful of myself and my writing skills and being able to really uh, articulate what I wanted to say, so I said, you know what, I'm not gonna do any writing, anything that's standing in front of public, maybe just be the dancer, be in the background, and that's just the way I always <laughs> wanted to be, and the way that I thought I could navigate and get through my time without getting in any trouble, just stay in the background, and just don't move if you don't have to, till you're out of there. Um, so with all, that, all those hesitations, I will join, these programs, but always very, uh, just, you know, always just holding back. And little by little through these programs, I was letting myself loose. I learned through the programs that I am an individual and, and I, I am not perfect, that is clear. I make awful mistakes, and, but there's a way in which I can make them better. I can, I can be a better person, I can stand today and, and, and do something that doesn't only describe the negative part of me or the dark side of me, but it can also enlighten the positive one, which I do have. Um, so being in the programs and seeing the end result and have family come and see it and see me perform and see do the art that I did as a backdrop or have me just watch me do certain movements among another couple of inmates when we create these scenarios uh, was very rewarding and liberating. And for those moments that the workshop lasted, I felt as though I was not in prison. I was, I was in a, a theater workshop where I was trying to be someone other than myself at the present moment. And to me, that was just something that I always looked forward to. Because without them, then, I was back to being my crime. Because to me, prison, that's what it was. You know, wearing the burgundy shirt, jeans, and skippies, and walking the same um, walkway to get to a town hall at a certain time, and have a meal, 
and then walk back, and then be locked in your cell, and just being in a tiny bunk bed, and the next day repeat it, and repeat the same thing over and over again. To me, it was just a constant reminder of what I was there for, a crime. And um, it was exhausting for me to constantly be reminded that I am this crime, and that's how I'm known, and that's all anybody will know of me. So it was um, because of these programs that eventually I was able to let go of that, of that past, of that definition of myself, and reinvent myself. So it was liberating. I think it's incredibly profound and it's when you come to York and come to a performance, to see, especially to see the performances, um, because it really does change the dynamic, because I think everybody who goes to prison goes there with the shadow identity of, who, of what they did, the act that brought them to prison, and the performances really allow you to see the whole being, that we're all flawed, we all make mistakes, uh, we all need to move forward, and many times we don't allow certain people to do that, and prisons are made of concrete and steel, and they encase people's lives in the actions of their past. And so I think the, the arts really helped to kind of break some of those things down. I went to, to York to visit just on Thursday, even though I've retired and I still try to <laughs> sneak in the front door as often as they let me. And, and so some of the women share their thoughts as well. And Shannon, and I believe Shannon's family is here today, so thank you for coming. Uh, Shannon reflected on what life in prison would be like without art. And Shannon said, without art and inmate's time would definitely be impacted. As an inmate, we have no sense of identity. We wear the same clothes, and we are identified by a six-digit number. It doesn't matter if you're here for 30 days or 30 years. We're viewed the same. Art gives us back our identity. And I think that's what we're, we're, we're sharing today. Yahira and Yahira's family is here as well. I saw them earlier. Um, Yahira said, art helped me to learn about who I'm trying to become. Art is the way I show all of my emotions. It is a way for me to be safe within my own thoughts. It is a way to express what I feel in a place where authenticity is frowned upon. Art shows who I am. And Tracy, I don't know if Tracy's family's here. I hope they're here. Yes, wonderful. Thank you for coming. Um, Tracy said, what some may not realize is women in prison are not merely devoid of freedom and materialistic possessions. Many lack self-love and self-esteem as well. Learning that I'm capable of creating beautiful things was an amazing realization. Women like me are unfamiliar with feeling proud of themselves. Hearing someone compliment your work can be overwhelming at first. In exhibiting or publishing our work, you give us validation. At long last, we feel worth. So those are some of the words from the women at York as well. Um, uh, Joe, Joe, oh, I just sorry, wanted sorry. to share um, one uh, anecdote about Robin Ledbetter, whose work I, I read first uh, this afternoon. And she's the one who has the long, very, very long sentence. Um, and when I'll Fly Away was about to be published, um, I went with a lot of excitement to you know, pass out uh, copies to the women and show them. You know, so, and they were all flipping through to see their name in print and so forth. And I happened to be seated next to Robin. And I noticed that she didn't open her book and that she was kind of hyperventilating. And I, I, I leaned over and I whispered, I said, Robin, are you OK? And she said, yeah. She said, but um, this is something good that's happened. And whenever something good happens in my life, it's scary. I'm, uh, I'm afraid. I'm afraid of that. And um, you know, that's the that's the extent to some people are are sort of beaten down, and uh, to be afraid of success. Um, so you make that bridge, or you help the person make that bridge over to the other side of those feelings of, of self worth. Um, so it's it's really, I have learned so much. I think I've learned more than any of the women that I've. You know, that I've worked with in prison. I, and I would imagine that 
um, Judy, and um, <laughs> yeah, I see, I see you, uh, uh, Joanne, nodding over there. Um, and while I, while I have the mic, I just wanted to uh, make uh, one more acknowledgement. Uh, two people who um, are here today uh, who have been really wonderful uh, to the women. Uh, they are on the, st on the staff of York. They're colleagues of, of Joe's, or former colleagues of Joe's, I guess, now. Um, Leslie Ridgway, who is the, uh, the school counselor. Would you stand up and just wave, Leslie? And next to her is uh, Monica Lord, who is a, a teacher. <laughs> Teaches a lot of the GED classes. Um, Monica really cracks the whip, so instead of Monica Lord, we kind of think of her as Lord Monica. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Just so you and, know, she thinks of herself as Lord Monica as well. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, they are they are great, and uh, and and they're they're my they're our handlers at the uh, in the in the writing program. I'm so dangerous that I have to have handlers when I go down there. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I was just given the, the five minute warning and, I, and because we're gonna open up to questions. And I also wanted to make sure that I had a couple more pieces to share from the women at York and then I wanna to touch on what I think will obviously be our last question, but you'll have time to bring us back to more questions. Um, so talking from the voice of the women again, uh, Shakima shared that art has helped me with my personal healing that I never thought could happen. Art has become my personal outlet for my built up anger and bitterness. It has helped me look at life differently. The shared dining project brought my mother and I closer. I am able to talk to her about things I never would have been before. And Trisha, and I know Trisha's family's here. I met them, at, saw them at lunch. <laughs> um, Trisha shared, art has allowed me to find solace in being able to honor the women that have raised, loved, and supported me unconditionally. I am so thankful that this venue has provided a place for my family and friends to gather. Although I am not at the program, I know that there's a part of me there today. And that was Trisha from York CI. Um, and then just for our last formal question, um, and we can all kind of just jump in on this one, is, do you have to defend your beliefs about the role and necessity of art in prison? And how has that come about in your life? And how have you reacted to it? Um, and so I don't know, I know Wally has um, <laughs> many times, um, but also for Lizette and for, for Kelly as well. Um, how do you have to defend the necessity of art in prison? Or how have you defended the necessity of art in prison? Uh, for me, um, defended the, the role of art? Yeah, many people feel art has no place in prison. Our tax dollars shouldn't support it, which they don't, by the way, because we spend no, US, no Connecticut tax dollars on the programs. They're, they're funded through private donations and nonprofits. Um, but that many people feel that art doesn't belong in a prison. So how have you or would you defend um, the role of arts in, in prison? I would absolutely uh, defend um <laughs> the, the, the role of art in prison um, simply because not only have you know have I watched myself uh, bloom and blossom and grow as an artist um, I've also witnessed other women you know who used art as an amazing vehicle to transform their life to express themselves to build confidence um, and you know just uh, just expand and enrich the quality of uh, you know their human experience um, you know in life uh, in life you know behind the, the walls um, of York um, to be able to uh, witness that you know, in all areas of the, of the arts. Uh, I watched uh, one woman, dear friend, who could barely put a sentence together. And now she uh, has become one of the star writers for the Judy Dwaran performance uh, project. 
her confidence. She was meek and broken and just a mess when she first came in. And we went to our very first uh, group, a grief and loss group, and we learned that, you know, grief and loss was not only from losing, you know, a loved one, but, you know, going, uh, being incarcerated, you know, there's, there's great grief and loss, and it could be materialistic things, uh, you know, the grief and loss of, uh, of the disconnect from our loved ones and so many, but to be able to witness her, uh, you know, nine years later, taking courses at Wesleyan University and uh, just, you know, flying high, it's just, has been what a, you know what a what an honor to uh, to see a dear friend flourish because of the arts. So, yeah. I think um, every um, prisoner at this moment at York will um, um, truly support and defend the idea that the arts should not be. Uh, should not only be um, provided to prisons, but more likely um, it should be more of um, a human right to have um, because of the positive effects it has in every single human being, especially those seeking for change and growth. Um, and although many walk into the facility, in my experience, um, Women walk in not because they want to be in prison. Um, they commit a crime. We commit crimes, and we are broken. We are broken dolls that do not know how to deal with our issues uh, and our struggles. Um, and the arts, I think, provide uh, it, it creates this leeway where you not only find yourself, but you also learn to accept yourself. And with that acceptance, um, you open room for growth, for change. Um, and I think that it, it should definitely be a law <laughs> to, <Well. laughs> to instead of um, perceiving punishment and incarceration as, well, you owe us this time. You are going to sit in prison for four years uh, and just, you know, bite your nails, just eat, or just sleep all day, you know, made a, a demand as a society that you seek the change that you need so that when you come out, you no longer go back to prison and you continue to help us grow as a society. And with, if we were to come up with more programs that will mandate most of the inmates, I think great changes will happen um, in, in the nation because it, that is exactly what it does. And unfortunately, we think, well, the arts is just for, you know, kids or somebody that really earns to have fun with the arts. But no, when you're broken, when, when you are in so much pain and you have this anger uh, in yourself and this sense of shame and guilt, what a better tool than to use the arts so that at your own pace, little by little, as you open, certain doors within yourself, you not only rediscover yourself, but you seek to change for the better. Mm -hmm. So definitely, Excellent. make it a law. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we have the right audience, and we have the governor of Connecticut, and we have uh, <laughs> Kathy Malloy, who's the head of the Arts Council in Greater Hartford, and I think Kathy would agree um, that she would love to make art a law in the state of Connecticut and throughout the country, um, and certainly make fundraising a lot easier um, if it was mandated by law. <laughs> so I think that was a really great way and a great poignant way to, to sum up uh, today's discussion. And, and we really have a little bit of time. We have a great reception. I don't know how much time we have, uh, five minutes which York time, that's two years. Uh, <laughs> but, fi but, we're on, but we're on Elizabeth Sackler time, so we've got five minutes. Um, if anybody wants to go to the mics on either side of the auditorium and pose a question um, or a comment, we'd love to hear from you. And we'll give you all a minute or two to muster up that courage um, to ask the, that question. And then we we'll probably can get in one or two questions. <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, hello. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on, uh, you know, the walls keeping the women and, and inmates in general in, I've come to realize is also a way of keeping them hidden so that the yes. rest of the world, so that we don't have to, we don't have to look, we don't have to see what's going on. And I think that the art is, aside from the amazing power it has for anyone who participates, it's an amazing conduit to bring those stories out into the public. Because I know, for one, before you know, recent exposure uh, to the whole system, you know, it, it does so much to humanize, in, in, rather than just numbers, the people who are behind uh, the walls. And it, it, as an example of how it really does humanize, oddly enough, my hairdresser's husband is one of the CEOs at York. Um, and, oh yes, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of chatting. Um, but, but I had the privilege of going in and seeing one of the performances um, in the facility. And when I, next time I was there, I was talking to the stylist and mentioned I had been there and had met her husband. And she said, oh, he talked about that. And he talked about how powerful it was and how he, it really changed the way that he looked at the women, the women with whom he had been working for years and years and years. So it's so powerful, not just for the people who participate on the inside, but for all of us. And if we want to see any kind of reform, we need to increase those highways of information between the inside and the outside. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, you know, when I, um, when I started at the prison, uh, is my my stereotypes about how who I thought you all were uh, were were sort of you know they blew away immediately, and I had no um, I had no idea that we were going to do books of of writing, um, but one day shortly after um, I started at the prison, I met a woman while I was Christmas shopping, a friend of mine, and she said, "What do you you know what, what's up? What have you been doing?" And I started talking about this program that I had just started. And she said, um, with this sort of smirk on her face, oh, gee, maybe I'll go commit a felony so I can go down there and, enjoy, and uh, join all the fun. And um, you know, I took that comment, and that's what drove me to drive the women <laughs> to get so good so that their voices could get outside of the prison so that we could um, you know, defy those kind of stereotypes and say, think again and think more deeply. They are more than just their crimes. Amen. Thank you. All right, we have a chance for just one last question. I'll try to make it short. First, thank you for offering uh, your stories, and thank you for being here. Uh, I'm interested in what you suppose the role of art might be in, instead of fixing uh, a situation that's broken, and, and what it might be as a preventative measure, you know, um, would you be in the place that you are, or would you have been in the place that you were if art was more prevalent in your life when you were growing up? Hmm, good question. That's a great question. Yeah. Huh? Uh, yeah. yeah. No, that's a fantastic uh, question. Um, I didn't, uh, I, didn't, I didn't realize that, uh, you know, I had that inner artist in me, so I, I, I didn't even know who she was when she showed up, you know, <laughs> kind of. But um, I think so. Um, I, went to a, I, I went to a very, very good school, and, and there was art uh, present in my life. So I think... Um, you know, I think too, you know, I, I really embraced the arts once I got uh, to York because I was introduced to art at a very young age, um, you know, through, through my schools. Uh, by the time I was uh, maybe in uh, the latter part of junior high was when they started plucking the, the, uh, the arts out of the schools. So. Um, you know, I, I was fortunate to, to have uh, art present in my schools growing up, right. so. What was that? Can you react quickly or no? Uh, I couldn't understand the question. 
Okay, if, if art was present in your life earlier, might that have made a, a different art was present in your life earlier, would that have made a difference in your trajectory or your life uh, journey? Well, art was present in my life before uh, because uh, when I first migrated to the States, I felt, in a sense, somewhat a prisoner uh, within my own self because I, when, I, when I came, I had no um, knowledge of English and I struggled and I was a teenager, so I had a lot in my mind. Um, so I think I, I utilized the arts um, back in high school to uh, better adjust myself to a different culture and kind of get to know myself better. So art was um, introduced to me as, as a young teenager. Um, so I guess um, going to prison uh, with that somewhat experience, as, as though the prison one was more dramatic, I think the need really uh, present itself rapidly uh, upon um, um, incarceration where I needed to have some way of dealing with these emotions and this fear and pain and, and drastically just like grab the pen and I just went straight for, for the arts as a way of coping. Okay, I'm just gonna answer this quickly even though I have not been in prison. Uh, but, yeah. what, but for me it's all about validation. Um, I had no idea that I wanted to be a writer or that I was any good at it until eighth grade. I had a, a small, intimate moment with my eighth grade teacher, Mrs. Kramer. We were all silent reading, and she came up to me and she whispered in my ear, I suppose you know that you're a very good writer. It's like, what, me? And then at the end of that year, eighth grade graduation, um, I was called up to get a writing award. I opened up the envelope, there was $5 in it. And I thought they had made a mistake. And I went down to Ocean Beach with a friend, and I spent my $5 on ski ball because I figured if I spent it, they wouldn't have to give it back. But uh, you know, to, I, th I might not have become a writer had it not been for somebody saying, you're a good writer, go for it. Mm -hmm. Excellent, yeah. thank you. have a law, not only for art in prison, but we need to have a law that art continues and stays in our education system. And yes. So um, for the family and friends of the women of York, I want you to know what a joy, what a pleasure, uh, what an incredible experience it was for me, for Rebecca, to work with the women of York. And I love you all dearly, and I'm very, very proud that um, shared dining is here and has been achieved, and that we are going to celebrate it now in a reception. And uh, this Thursday, I want to tell you that we do have another program for States of Denial. It's the Bard Prison Initiative. And uh, Max Kenner, is, who's founder of the, he's the executive director of the Bard Prison, Prison Initiative, is coming with two of his uh, alums, actually. And he is fighting for education in prison. In prison. And he is, uh, he's, I think he's just 25 years old, and he's already out there. He'll be here at 7 o'clock on Thursday. And so I hope uh, those of you who can will join us for that. But in the meanwhile, I want to thank Wally, I want to thank Lizette, Kelly, Joe. Thank you, thank all of you. And um, know that with programs like this, with people like Joe, with men like Wally, um, that your loved ones behind walls at York are being cared for and supported. Thank you very much. Thank you.